Good morning. Boy, the music goes off, and boy, it's just quiet. Very, very quiet. It's good to be here this morning. I know it's a little warm outside for the last few days and today, but um, I'm just thankful for those air conditioning units. They are working very well and uh, much better than what it could be. I often think about, uh, whenever it's hot days like this, I often think about uh, missionary stories that I've heard them telling us how it is whenever they're having church in either, you know, the Congo or in, a, in the jungles or whatever, and they have the sheep and the goats and the dogs and everything right there with them, and it's 110 degrees. And I'm thinking, we have it pretty good. We have it pretty good. We want to stand and sing a great song. I sing the mighty power of a God. Watch the words as we sing this, and uh, stand with us, please. sing and exalt the Lord our God. Last week I was so excited about getting up here to share the Word of God that I infringed on our time space between James ending the song and me starting. I mean, we have, we have a timetable that we have to keep here, so, uh, so I, I was appropriately late this morning. How about that? So, good to have you here, and um, 
I just wanted to uh, say that tomorrow is uh, Claudia and mine, my, our 58th wedding anniversary. And we just signed a new contract for one more year. So, uh, <laughs> but what a blessing it is to look back over 58 years and to be able to see how God brought us together, how God has kept us together because we have lived happily ever after. When we said I do, happily ever after, right? No. <laughs> Uh, ups and downs like everybody has in their marriage, but God is so good in, in uh, taking us through those. And I've told you before, but I, I was asked what, what the key to a long marriage is. And the key is, is certainly love, but even more than that, it's commitment. It's when you said, I do, I meant it. And there's a country and western song, and I'd do it again. I'd do it again without hesitation. Love you, Claudia. Hoping for another really good year or so. Anyway, also, uh, in my domestic skills, they are uh, growing each day. Um, James brought me some uh, blueberries from, uh, from his backyard, and I don't know what to do with blueberries except wash them and eat them. And so I looked up on, on the internet a, a recipe for blueberry buckle. A glorified name for a coffee cake but and I made it and it turned out good and um, so uh, you can just refer to me as Chef Dave after this okay all right well I'm glad that you're here today because we are going to uh, actually finish uh, last week's message um, and so that this message on Noah and his flood takes three chapters out, out of the Bible. Chapter 6, 7, and 8. And each one tells a, a story. And, and when we looked at that diagram that uh, was in the bulletin, it's in the bulletin again this week, um, this chiastic pattern or structure to these verses, they move one way of condemnation, God remembers Noah, and they move the other way to salvation where God starts off, I'm going to destroy this whole world, and God ends up, I'm not going to destroy it ever again with water. And so we're, we're taking our way through that, and we have seen that uh, we are, uh, this chapter is preparation for, for judgment, and God makes a dividing line. God divides the world in two, always in two, not three, not any more, not any less. God has a dividing line. You either believe or you don't believe. You either follow God or you don't follow God. There is no in between. There's not, well, maybe this week. No, it is either or. And it has always been that way. And so that dividing line is made very clear in Genesis chapter uh, 6. Uh, starting in verse 9, and we see the description of righteous Noah on one side, and how, how he is known as righteous. He believed God. He was blameless in his moral conduct. He was, and he walked with God, and not only did he walk with God, he preached righteousness. So this is one side of the line, and guess who gets saved? Who gets saved from the, this, these great floodwaters? It, it's the righteous. It's Noah. And it, out of all the world, it comes down to eight people. But primarily, it focuses on Noah as the one who believes. Then there's the description of the wicked in verses 11 through 12, that they are violent, they are corrupt, they're immoral, and they don't walk with God, they walk their own way. And that has been man's problem from the very beginning. Man wants to be his own God. I don't want God, some God who has morals and ethics to judge me. I, I can choose what I want to do. And have we seen that? We see it all the time. We, all you have to do is raise children. And you will see that they... I'm sorry, but... 
except for you two, okay? Uh, children always want to press the limits to be their own boss. And what are we here for? To change their opinion. To get, aim them in the right direction because children do not make good decisions. And when you're your own God, you do not make good decisions. And so here is the dividing line. The righteous, moral, blameless, walking with God versus violent, corrupt, and walking by their own rules and standards. And we're talking about this is universal in scope. And all of a sudden we're looking at this, this dividing line. And you would think, wouldn't you, that there would be more people on God's side than on the other side. I mean, if you're going to line up and say, this is what I stand for, but you're looking at eight people over on this side, and you guys get to be righteous today, and wicked and evil over here, and it is a billion versus eight, give or take. I mean, we're... we're t so, so, let me ask you this. The majority is always right. What? Oh, but everybody's doing it. Do you, see, do you see that it majority doesn't matter with God? Because God over here is the majority. It, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, does, or anything. God has set the limits. God has set the rules. And we need to remember that in everything that we do and that we say... Because mankind had forgotten God, but God had not forgotten mankind because God laid bare what man was doing. And so God had a plan, and that plan was in verse 13, and his intent was to put an end to all life in this world, and he did it um, with a flood. He was going, he destroyed it. And then we saw that uh, number two was his protection. And this is the building of the ark. And we talked about the size of the ark and the kinds of things like that. We gave you some um, uh, resources that uh, we had seen from the ark encounter. And I think at the end of the service, they'll be on the screen, the, the websites where you can go. Because I want, there is so much that corroborates all that we're seeing in Scripture. Scripture uses an economy of words to tell us tons of stuff. And you can get mired down into the, uh, the minutiae and you forget what, what's going on, but the minutiae is fun. It's good. It's, you start to get some insights that you would never have gotten before. So he tells... Um, Noah, so make yourself an ark, cypress wood, with rooms, and, and coat it with pitch. And so we, we looked at all of those last week. He gave them the dimensions. It's a football field and a half, a long, almost a half as wide as a football field and 45 feet high. It was, it was an incredible undertaking. And then uh, in verse 16, we saw some additional uh, insights into how to make a roof um, and what that would be, do, a door, and there was only one of the doors and three decks. And so when we look at Scripture, be careful not to try to impose too much on it because not all the specifications are here. And we talked a little bit last week about the fact that when Moses went to build the, the tabernacle, were those... Um, specifications complete. A lot more than this, right? Remember? What, how many rings and how many posts and how many of this and he, he laid it all out. We, we get the and, and the, the tabernacle was small compared to this but we're talking this huge arc and he gives these minimal uh, specifications. I'm sure I'm sure that he gave more than this because the ark is a magnificent structure. It had to be. 
and the engineering skills that went behind it and all of that. So whether God placed those skills within people, Noah especially, but others, uh, we're not sure. But it was adequate for its intended purpose. So I think we're picking up right here. Um, and we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 16 and then 19 through 21. And it says this. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, or at least those identifying as same, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and, and store it away as food for you and for them. So God is specific here. He's telling them that it's going to take, when this is all over, these animals are going to be saved, right? They're not going to perish in the flood. So how are they going to reproduce? He says, you need a male and you need a female. And they came in as pairs. Um, and so two of every kind and probably young. A lot of people, uh, you know, think, well, he had dinosaurs on there. Probably did. Um, but they were the young so they wouldn't take up near as much space, and they weren't going to reproduce during that year, so uh, probably the younger would have um, been more likely to do that. Um, and then uh, not only two, two of male and female, but two of every kind. And people get a little bit uh, confused here because when you look at the number of species in the world today, you're looking at over a million. But if you're looking at kinds, and kinds is defined as something that never changes into another kind. So there's no crossover between whatever it is, like a dog, okay? Probably descended from a wolf, but a wolf is a dog, right? And then you, you see all these different dogs, uh, all the way down to the last in line, which is a poodle. <laughs> That's for you, Doug. Uh, <laughs> but you look at a poodle and a wolf and you say, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? A dog. You're seeing a dog kind. Now there's all sorts of variations within it, but it's a dog. It is not a cat. And you look at cats and they're all different kinds of cats, but they're still in the cat kind. And so there are kinds uh, that that are in this world and those kind never change into another kind and it's a group of related animals not related to any other animal. Noah, this is what I found in, in uh, the Ark Signs book. A, Noah was responsible for fewer than 6,744 individual animals. Most were small and easily maintained and fewer than 1,400 known living and extinct kinds. So the ark, what, it, what that's all saying is the ark was big enough for every kind of animal that needed to be saved to start the world over on the other side of the flood. It was not jam-packed. There was no one left out. And so then it says... They will come to you. Isn't that amazing? They will come to you. Now, part of our problem is that we think of the world then as the world we see now. So if a lion was going to come, it'd either have to come from a zoo or it would have to come from Africa. And if we were here, and that's where the ark was being built, then it would have to somehow, with its mate, get across an ocean and I don't think they would take a COVID test at that time to, you know, be able to get on an airplane or anything like that. They, they were not, but that couldn't be. You couldn't get all the different kinds of animals to voluntarily come to a one spot on the earth now because we're divided by huge oceans and, and other uh, things that would make, make it very difficult for them to get here. 
But at that time, the continents were pushed together. There were seas, if you will, but it was a more even distribution. Not the real highs and lows that we have today. And the other thing is, because of the vapor canopy over the earth, the climate was the same North Pole, South Pole, doesn't matter where you went. It was almost the same. So the animals then would have been equally distributed throughout. They would not be the animals that only could live in the desert or only in the mountains or those kind of things. They would be evenly distributed. So the idea of these animals, all the different kinds, being evenly distributed near where he was, they started to come. But how did they come? Did it say to Noah, go out and lasso them? Did it say, go pull them in? Make sure you don't miss any? No. God says, when at the time is ready, they will come to you. I believe that God directed them. That's number one. Because he's sovereign and he brought them there. But I also believe that God doesn't use miracles unless it's absolutely necessary. God builds into his creation that which many times blows our mind, right? And one of the things is migration. I mean, you, you look and study about animals and how they migrate even now from one place to the other. How they, give, how they have this idea. I, I was doing, watching some on butterflies. And they start up in Canada and they end up in Central America. I mean, how in the world does a butterfly get that? And not just one butterfly, but millions of them. They all get to how? How? Does God every, every year do a miracle in a butterfly's little life and say, this is where you're going to go? No, God built within them a GPS system that is amazing. And, and there's something that triggers it within their bodies that says it's time to go. And this is the way we're going. And so I believe that this... This is one of the first animal migrations. I think there's a built-in genetics. They didn't have to migrate at this time. But I, get, I, I would say that God stirred that, and then God's hand certainly led them there. And then they were also to put food uh, that was to be eaten by the animals and also by them, uh, storage for water and other things that they were to put on that ark for what would be a year. Don't forget that. Because how long did it rain? 40 days, 40 nights. And many times if you ask people how long was Noah in the ark, uh, there was 40 days and 40 nights. No, it was a whole year. And so there had to be provisions. And I, I believe, too, that some of the animals went into a semi-hibernation uh, and that kind of thing. So there wasn't as much need for all of it. But there would still be a whole bunch of other things that needed to be taken care of. And that's why going to some of these resources like the Ark Encounter and that, to read about them, it, it'll fascinate you beyond measure. Number three, his means, verse 17. Is that the first one in your notes? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I used to listen to John MacArthur on a pretty regular basis. I just like the way he uh, attacks the different uh, parts of scripture. But if you, it was back on cassette tape. Any, any, anybody? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he would preach for an hour. But the first 30 minutes was a review of last week's message. <laughs> and if you listen to that tape, you had it already. <laughs> so, uh, sorry. All right. His means, verse 17. He says, I, this is God talking, I am going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. So he's talking about land. That's just the main thing he's talking about because you don't see any fish getting on to 
to the ark. I, I've, I've seen the little uh, uh, things with where the kids have the ark, and in Noah's in, in Noah's living quarters, there's a little bowl with a goldfish sw swimming around in it. Uh, no, he didn't have, now many. And, and maybe most fish died in, in the floodwaters because this was not a tranquil flood, and we'll see that more next week when we get to it. But um, those were not brought onto the ark. Those that God wanted to preserve, he did through the flood. But these are earth-bound uh, animals, animals that need the earth to survive. So they're, they're talking about the domesticated animals, the wild animals, the things that crawl on the, on the ground, and also the birds of the air. And, and he says, I'm going to destroy this world with a flood. Now who's he talking to? He's talking to Noah. We're talking in this period of what they call antediluvian period. This is pre-flood. So how was the earth how was the earth watered before the flood? It was uh, the the dew of the ground would come up and a mist would form and it would it would water everything with that. There was no rain from Adam until the flood. No rain. So if there's no rain, there's not going to be any floods. And now just put yourself in Noah's place. And he's talking to God who created everything. And God says to him, I'm going to destroy this place with a flood water. And what would be your first question to God? What's a flood? What's a flood? Because he had never seen it. But you know what? You know what Noah did? He believed God. I, I don't even know what this is. I don't even know how to comprehend what all of this is. But he believed God. He had faith in what God was telling him. And I think it's a story for us as well, don't you? Do you know everything that's going to happen? Do you? We, we just went through all the study of the tribulation period, and that's a horrendous time, something we have never seen on this earth. But do you believe it? Why? Why do you believe it? Because God said it. It's recorded in his word. That's why we believe it. Do you know what heaven is like exactly? We don't we know much about it, but we don't. We, anybody been there? Anybody going? All right, all right. We had several raise their hand. <laughs> we may have an altar call at the end of this one. <laughs> we, we don't know. Have you passed through death yet? Have you, have you faced that challenge yet? No. But do you believe that God says that you are going to go through that and you are going to be with him for eternity? I believe it. I haven't seen it. But I believe it. And this is Noah looking at the world around him and God says, build a, a boat in the middle of the land and I'm going to destroy this world with water, a flood. What is it? And can you believe the critics? Here he is out there hammering on, on his ark and they're coming... And he then the crowd gathers and he says, well, I'm going to take a little time to preach right now. And he says, God is warning us that he is going to judge this world through floodwaters. What do you think, that, how they reacted? They said, boy, this is open mic comedian night. And Noah said, I'll be here all week. No. Uh, <laughs> Noah is preaching to skeptics who say, what's a flood? What's rain? What is all of this? How is this ever going to work? You think that ship's going anywhere? It doesn't even have a motor. No place for oars. Nothing. And they were criticizing him over and over. And you know for how long? 120 years. I have a hard time taking criticism for 120 seconds. 
But he stood for a hundred and twenty years and he warned them of things not yet seen. But Hebrews says that Noah believed God and built the ark. He says, I'm going to use it to destroy all life, all land animals, but not all marine species because we still have them. And the flood was a unique, unique in all history. It is not a local flood, it is a universal flood. There are many today who believe that this story is about a flood in Mesopotamia, someplace over in the Tigris-Euphrates area, that it only flooded in that area. What is wrong, just common sense, what is wrong with thinking it was a local flood? Well, first of all, all the alls. I'm going to destroy all land animals. Well, now, I am... If you, if you look at the fossil record from the lowest levels up to the highest levels, okay, that's how evolution kind of got its idea that we started as single cell and then we eventually evolved into all these uh, things. And not, that's not true, but that's, that's how the, the fossil record is recorded. So where would a fish most likely go if the waters are there? They'd be at the lowest. We find a lot of fish in the lowest levels of fossil records. But then as the animals, as we start to move up the chain, if you will, you start to see the animals that thought more. So that's why they, probably the apes are uh, up near the top and, th and many of the land animals. So if they saw the rain coming down and the flood was rising, what would they naturally do? They would go to high ground, wouldn't they? Oh, okay, all right, yeah. They would go to high ground. And who would be at the highest ground? Man, right? Wouldn't it be man? Because he's thinking, I know, water coming up, and there's a higher peak over there, so you would tend to find them at the highest levels. So if it was just a local flood, why stay there? Why not go over the mountain? Why not go someplace else? What, a bird would just take off and find the first place, you know, that it could be above the waters and it would stay there. Th this would make the entire account of what God said he was going to do, it would make it a lie. So either it is a local flood or a universal flood. What was God dealing with? He was de dealing with universal wickedness. How was he going to deal with it? He was going to give the earth a bath. And he was going to cleanse it from all of that wickedness. And not everybody was just grouped right around there in that Mesopotamian valley or wherever it was that he was building the ark. They were spread out over the world. It had to be. It's a billion or more people on the earth at the time. So they, they couldn't all be in a little village. Or get, have you seen the scenes where Noah's standing on the, near the ark and he's preaching to a crowd of about 50 people? Uh, you know, there were cities, there were all these things that were going on at the time. So it was either local or universal, and I believe it has to be for a Bible-believing person that a, is a universal flood. And you can find out more information on those websites about that as well. In fact, in the New Testament, the Greek word for deluged and destroyed in Second Peter is cataclysmus. What does that sound like? Cataclysm. It's just a, a word that was just taken from one language into the other. It, and a ca cataclysm is something that is completely ruinous. It, it will take everything out. So don't be pulled in by the fact that uh, because this story has been uh, marginalized, it has been uh, dumbed down, especially for like the Sunday school classes for little kids. You know, we want them to get the whole concept here. But we, we forget that God is dealing with a lost world in a very dramatic way. And this was a cataclysm. And then, verse 18, God's covenant. God's covenant. 
it says, but, don't you love that? Here we're talking about all of this disaster. We're talking about the rains that are coming down. We're talking about all of mankind except for eight people being wiped out. But God comes back and he says, but I will establish my covenant with you, Noah, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. Eight people. I will establish my covenant with you. Not with them. Remember the dividing line? There's the righteous and there's the wicked. He says, with you, Noah, I am going to establish my covenant. And now we're, we will see the details of this covenant in chapter 9. We won't go there right now. But the definition of a covenant is a promise of God to people with whom he is dealing in a special way. And he is dealing definitely with them in a special way. And this is the first mention of the word covenant, but it won't be the last that we see. And, and we see that when God makes covenants, he makes two kinds. One is a conditional covenant, and another is an unconditional covenant. When he says, I'm going to save you, and I'm not going to destroy the world again, we'll see that in chapter 9, it, that is an unconditional covenant. That is God making it and God standing behind it. So is that going to be true? Is that it, it cannot be broken. But there are conditional covenants that God has made with man. In fact, with Abraham, he made a covenant and said, I will, I will give you the land, I will uh, make you um, uh, prosperous, and, and uh, lots of families will come from you. That was unconditional part of the covenant. But when he said, if you obey these things, then you, you will have all the benefits of the covenant. But if you don't obey, I'm going to punish you. That is a conditional con covenant. If you do this, then I'll do this. And we see all the way through the Old Testament that um, those, those covenants uh, were broken on a regular basis. But the time, these unconditional covenants were, first of all, you look at them and they're established by God. Is God a truth teller? Absolutely. Does he ever tell a lie? Does he ever promise anything that he doesn't deliver? And the answer to those things is no. He always does what he says. And so these covenants are established by God and they are eternal. They have an eternal value to them. And they're always by grace. And this sustained Noah for that 120 years of ridicule and I believe that God's promises still sustain us. But I wanted to just take a quick little diversion here. <laughs> and you say, Dave, quick? Eh. <laughs> Probably not going to happen. But I want to talk to you just a little bit about the new covenant. Because it, these are the covenants that came uh, from God. And, and the new covenants talked about a lot, uh, not only in the Old Testament, but especially in the New Testament. And, and the new covenant is this. The promise that God makes with mankind, that's with us, that he will forgive sin and restore communion with those whose hearts believe in his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. <laughs> He, he, you know what? He made that covenant without asking me first. Or you. He said, this is the new covenant that I am making with you. And Jesus is the mediator of that, that covenant. His death on the cross is the basis of the promise. He could not make this covenant with us to bring us back into a right relationship without the death of his son. He defeated death by his resurrection and he returned life to us who believe. Because Jesus rose, we too have new life. In John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's his covenant. If you believe, 
This is, this is what you get. You get eternal life. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 19, it, it talks about the fact that he was at the communion, the Last Supper, and he took the bread and he blessed it and he passed it around. But then it says, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. My blood is the new covenant. It is what satisfies all of God's righteous demands against a sinful person and brings us into a right relationship with him. He goes on in John chapter 14 to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the only way you can get there is through that new covenant, the new covenant of his blood. See, in the Old Testament, there was the old covenant, the Mosaic law. But that was broken over and over, wasn't it? Because the law was never designed to save anyone. The law was designed to show you what a sinner you are. How's it doing? Just with the top ten, folks. How's it doing? Yeah. We don't stand up well against to do it. But what it's designed to do was to bring us to God. And the Old Testament sacrifices were a prelude to what Christ would do on the cross. But the prophets kept telling the nation of Israel, there's a time when God will rescue his people and renew a covenant that cannot be broken. In Jeremiah 31, it says, The days are coming when I will make a new covenant with my people, or the people of Israel and Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their, with their ancestors, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time. And this is looking forward to the millennial period, okay? And it, here's what it is. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. What does God do for us right now with this new covenant? Does he not write his law, his love, and everything in our heart? It, it, it's not about all the outward things that we do. And he's going to do the same thing with the nation of Israel. We're under the new covenant right now. And the nation of Israel is not going to be left out. God will write on their hearts and in their minds and they will be his people and he will be their God. It will no longer be an external thing, but internal. And Hebrews says this new covenant is based on better promises. And the better promise is, is that it's unconditional. God's promise of him saving us and bringing us back into a right relationship if we believe in his son is unconditional. You accept it and you are secure forever. And so this is the covenant that he made with Noah in the sense that he is promising Noah what he's going to do and he's going to save Noah and his family through this flood. And letter D, Noah's obedience. We see it in verse 22, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. We also see it in chapter 7, verse 5, verse 9, and verse 16. It's repeated every... Uh, at least four times there. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. And we said, that's exactly what we do. <laughs> oh, to be a Noah, right? Did Noah know all that God was going to do? No, but he believed God by faith and he did what God asked him to do. He says, build a boat. And what did he do? He built a boat. He stocked it. He did it exactly the way that God wanted. He allowed the animals to come on. When God told him to get in, he got in. All of these things Noah did by obedience and reverence for the God who, take, who had brought him thus far. In your notes, you'll see a, a quote by Henry Morris. I'm, I'll add to it a little bit. But Noah had strong faith. His task was monumental. It was difficult, it was discouraging, and fulfillment was deferred. 
the one thing out of, I mean, all those things are, are difficult, but hope deferred is really something. We, we don't like that, do we? I had one of my kids write me and say, showed me a shirt that they wanted, and they said, could I get it as a Christmas present? That was last week. I said, of course. No, I didn't. But we, we don't like to do things on a deferred basis, do we? It's out here. Noah was, was pleased in his faith. He knew that the task was hard and all of these things. But his attitude, his attitude is he never questioned or complained. He just obeyed. There is no record either in the Old Testament or the New Testament that Noah ever complained to God, this is too hard. Why are you asking me to do this? How come I'm the only one in the world? Noah is not, it's not recorded any place that he complained to God. He just obeyed. And he shows us what it means to be righteous. That he placed everything and based everything he did on the word of God and he obeyed it. This is what is so wonderful about reading God's Word, about hearing about it. We know that it's true. Noah knew that it was true. And when he knew something was true, he obeyed. He walked with God. He not only walked with God in the short term, boy, that little sprint. He walked with God over the long haul. It says he was 600 when God shut him in the ark. But for the previous... 120 years he was building that ark and being ridiculed and, and chastised for, for doing it. But he walked with God and he believed in the only one who could save them. And I ask, shouldn't we be the Noahs today? Shouldn't we be the Noahs that believe what God is saying with all the things going on in, in politics in the world and the chaos that's there, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt who's in control. And we have to trust him. That does not mean that it's life ha and happiness ever after. We may have to suffer for our stand for, for God and for his word like Noah did. But God is pleased with those kind of people. So next week, we are going to take a look at destruction and salvation, the actual flood, and seeing um, what we can glean from that. So let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word today. We thank you that we are seeing a story unfold about just about one man against the entire population of the world. We sometimes get into these feelings like we're the only one. We know we're not. But yet, that's what it came down to for Noah. And he believed in things not yet seen. And God counted it to him as righteousness. So we pray, Father, that we would be people like Noah. That we would not only believe you, but that we would obey. And that we would share our faith with any who will listen. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Oh, the faith and, and obedience of, of Noah. When you, when you think about the unknowns and all that and what he didn't know. And um, I often think, though, you, you see in there that it says that God said, God said. So I think he was in constant communication with his God. And uh, this song that we're going to sing, I think it's something that we need to do as well, is to be praying, asking our God to give us the faith and the assurance that we need. And the song is, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. Stand with us, please.
so shall I never die, but live with Thee the perfect life of Thy eternity. This morning during practice, uh, Linda came up to me and said, hey, that song that we're going to be singing day by day, could we dedicate this to, to Margie this morning? And I think it's a great song. And so we want to do that. Margie, I know she's watching. And uh, so let's sing day by day. This last song here before uh, prayer is Trust and Obey, as Noah trusting.
Take your seats. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for the word that was preached this morning, for the fact that you are a God of mercy, and you are a God of details and organization, and how that you, Father, give us promises in your word that uh, that we can count on because of who you are thank you lord for your great many promises as it says precious promises to us might we just uh, be able to stand firm on your word like like noah did thank you for your word the complete word that we have now and uh, we praise you for that thank you lord for um, the ones that are here, we pray for those ones that are not here. Pray for, um, mentioned Margie earlier, pray for Margie this, this morning, Lord, that you would just give her uh, your comfort, that you'd give her your peace, that you would uh, continue as uh, she encourages us and uh, in the letters and the notes that she sends. Thank you for her, her faith and unwavering uh, faith in you, Lord. Pray for um, just that you would um, be with her family, be with her husband and son, that you'd give them that same peace. They would draw close to you and to her. And um, what a great example, Lord, uh, that we see. Lord, we pray this morning for uh, our church, for the fact that uh, your church in this community and just for uh, we praise you for individuals and the things that they are doing thank you for the gifts and the abilities that you've given individuals thank you that you are a god that gives everyone uh, spiritual gifts help us to um, use those help us to be willing help us to uh, uh, to just be able to to step forward as well and to um, do those things, Lord, that pleases you, and to use those things that you've given us. We want to thank you, Lord, for answered prayer this morning that we can all th right now think about, uh, that we go to you with. Sometimes we go to you in um, times of despair, and maybe um, after the events <clears throat> are, are done and over, and in that you've answered that we do not go back to you and thank you. Might we give you the praise this morning, Lord, on those things as we think through our week of what you've done and even ask in advance praise and give you thanks for it. Lord, we have a country that's um, um, in despair from our perspective often. Pray for our leaders. Pray for President Biden cabinet members, Congress, Senate, those folks that are in authority as well as our local government, Lord. Pray that you would convict, that you would turn their hearts, Lord, towards you. I pray that you would uh, bring folks alongside, that the word would be heard, that uh, we recognize that there's nothing impossible for you. And we pray, Lord, that you would do a mighty work in the leadership of our country, which will make a difference, Lord, in, in uh, what happens and what, what prevails. And yet, Lord, we pray as Christians that you would also work on us, that you would work in our hearts, 
that we would pray for revival and that we would pray for for those ones to repent and uh, those ones that uh, need to see you pray that that would be our convictions and not and not for what we think might be consequences but those things lord that pleases your heart lord we praise you and thank you for a great god that you are one who we don't always understand but know that you're always good always good and that you are a god who is um, not just a promise maker but a promise keeper as well lord Help us to focus on you, what you've done in the past, what, what your track record is. I pray, Lord, that you would help strengthen our faith. I am so encouraged from those lies, characters in the Bible, those individuals that you put there for our example. Praise you and thank you, Lord, for that we would look and we would look at our lives and say, how are we different? What can I do? Lord, praise you for a great service, for the fact that you've brought us here together. You are a God of mercy and grace. We see it on pages of scripture throughout the Bible, and it's no different in our lives today. Thank you. We give you just the abundance praise of what you're doing, and it's in your son's name. Amen. Good morning. Oh yeah, we have a good morning. We have a strange uh, juxtas juxtaposition of slides this morning. You see that first one, and you see, oh, it is kind of cool in here and the air conditioning. Well, the next one that pops up is coming next Saturday, men's breakfast. And if you look closely at those gentlemen, you'll notice they're all wearing wool shirts and long sleeve jackets. Maybe some down there. I don't even know. But uh, uh, that's because that picture is from January. So if you're coming to men's breakfast next uh, Saturday, feel free to wear a short sleeve shirt. That's okay. There's no dress code. But there's lots of good food and lots of good fellowship. Okay, also coming up uh, two weeks uh, from today, actually, is the uh, evening communion here at 6 o'clock. And uh, then the following week, our church barbecue. So uh, we'll have more information about the church barbecue next week during the announcements. So uh, uh, peel your ears for that, and uh, you'll get every question answered that you ever could have. Okay, coming up, uh, a dirty church, but you can help make it as clean as it usually is. And uh, uh, we have some uh, church cleaners who can tell you how easy it is, and also some others who can tell you how to do a super-duper job. So if you'd like to join a church cleaning team, uh, see me and let me know, and uh, we'll, we'll see if we can get some organized so that you can be part of that, too. It's all volunteer, and uh, you end up doing it for a month every three or four months, and you don't have to do it alone. Okay, well, CareNet giving, we still want to keep that going, and uh, I think sometime in probably August, uh, which is coming right around the corner tomorrow, but uh, August or maybe it'll even be early September, we'll be taking those bottles to them, and we also have collected some uh, uh, baby apparel and some other good things, so uh, they're doing good work, and we're going to keep supporting them uh, as they support moms and babies and uh, young families. Uh, Make, make the right decision, and uh, they share the gospel with them, pray with them, have resources for them. So it's not just all about the body, but it's also about the spirit. Okay, well, there's our contact information, and uh, uh, you're free at any time to send us an email at that address and let us know what your questions are or anything you want to share with us. But, uh, whoops, uh, Ralph and Joan, they send us emails too. Uh, so I had a secret signal from the back telling me that I jumped right over them. But uh, they're coming in September, and uh, that will be a blessing for us to hear what's going on in Japan. And uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll let them know also that we uh, share these uh, with uh, uh, folks around the world on our online ministry, and uh, maybe their folks back home will be watching them live while they're here. So, all righty. Now, we feel, free to, feel free to send us an email. And uh, as always, feel free to pray and uh, share your concerns with him. Okay, after today's service, we will have the answers to the sermon notes and uh, including those references to the uh, various uh, Genesis sites that you can get 
more good information from them. They'll, they'll be on the big screen and you will uh, uh, have them uh, uh, whether you're at home or whether you're sticking around here to see them. Also, they're in today's bulletin too. Okay, and uh, then one year Bible. Well, Mark uh, wanted to be here, but he couldn't be here. So uh, he gave me an opportunity to, to share some things I noticed in the one year Bible. Well, we are this week in the New Testament moving from reading in Romans to uh, 1 Corinthians. And uh, Romans is a great book, has lots of great uh, back, not background, fundamental things that, that Paul wanted to share with the people of Rome. Then uh, he thought, but I've got to get a little more practical when I'm talking to those people in uh, Colossae. Oh no, Corinth, Corinth. Corinth. Anyway, he, uh, so he, he writes a very practical letter for them, and then he has to write some more letters later on because they didn't seem to get all the details quite right. But he uh, has practical things for us there as well. So uh, you're going to enjoy reading that, I think, and there's probably going to be something in there that you're going to say, uh, oh, great, I always wondered about that. Now, I have good news. We've been reading in uh, Second Chronicles... It may seem like forever, but, you know, you have to keep things in perspective. Uh, it seems like forever because we had the benefit of reading First and Second Kings, and so we knew the story, and it was all fresh because we're reading the Bible every day. But the people who that was first written for, that, that being uh, Second Chronicles, they, for the most part, didn't have that benefit. Uh, they, were, they were in prison working as slaves and so on in, a, in another country where they'd been hauled away and uh, they'd been there for a really long time. So uh, uh, the, a writer, we think it's probably Ezra, said, uh, here's some things we all need to, to know because uh, as you can see on that slide, I'm kind of starting at the back and working forward because that's how this really happened. Uh, the, the king of Persia, the most powerful king in the world probably at that point in time said, it's time to send the Jews back and let them rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And he said that because God had said 70 years before, that's what's going to happen. And of course, the king had to do what God said to him. So the books that we've been reading told all of the things that Ezra and thus God thought those folks needed to know about all the good things that had happened in the kings of Israel and a lot of bad things that had happened. So they, here's what we don't want to do, here's what we want to do, and of course we know with the benefit of hindsight they didn't, they didn't respond perfectly to what they were taught. But uh, if you just look at what the prophecies are and look at what uh, Jeremiah or what uh, Ezra says, and we're going to be seeing this on Friday, uh, in fact, did I write it down? No, I didn't write it down. He said, uh, it starts right off with good news. Uh, the, the king of Persia decreed this. And uh, uh, you, you feel really good about that, but he's, he mentions, because Jeremiah wrote down, that's what's going to happen. And that was about 20 years before that. Uh, that well, actually about 70 years before that. But uh, uh, Jeremiah wrote it down and uh, the prophecy was fulfilled, and uh, they, needed, they needed that bit of good news at that point, but uh, if, if they had been reading every day in the one-year Bible, they would have already known about it. We'll, we'll be seeing that in October. Uh, we'll be reading Jeremiah then. So this is kind of a preview. As Ezra says, stick around, keep reading in October, because you're going to get it firsthand from uh, Jeremiah's pen. So, Okay, well, I think I've... Uh, rambled on long enough, except I get a, the opportunity to lead us in the offering prayer, and we found something in yesterday's reading that is great as a prayer for today's offering, and that is the 23rd Psalm. So pray with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He makes me strong again. He leads me in the way of living right with himself, which brings honor to his name. Yes, even if I walk 
through the valley of the shadow of death. I will not be afraid of anything because you are with me. You have a walking stick with which to guide and one with which to help. These comfort me. You are making a table of food ready for me in front of those who hate me. You have poured oil on my head. I have everything I need. For sure, you have given me goodness, or you will give me goodness and loving kindness all the days of my life. Then I will live with you in your house forever. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on us, which we cannot count or measure because they are so many and so great. In particular, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, we want to close with song. It's, it's not uh, sitting on the promises of God, but it's standing on the promises of God. So you, we're going to stand. And um, great song. When you think of Noah, he stood alone on the promises of God. We too need to do that. Let's sing. promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing of God, standing on the promises standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my 
Savior Promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing. Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Well, that's our MO this week, is standing on His promises. I like that four stanzas. It says, resting in my Savior as my all in all. That means not worrying about the things that come along because we know who He is and what He does. Have a great week. Enjoy the, the hot weather. We're dismissed. <laughs>